Greetings. You know the drill. We'll go live. Um, we'll we'll um, you'll hear the music and just go live. Have a good show. Got it. Okay. Thank you.
afternoon, everyone. My name is Don Parkinson, and I'm a consultation specialist with SNC Lavalin. Uh, today, we're continuing our series of live stream topics as our project moves through consultation round two of the environmental assessment phase. The topics we will be covering parallel our project activities, so we hope these will help our viewers and listeners better understand the project and provide input along the way. So let's get started. Uh, today we're going to alternative routes in the preferred corridor to help community members understand the thinking behind and activities associated with the process. So I'm going to try and walk you through um, how we got to where we are uh, with these three alternative routes um, and take you through step by step, give you a bit of a, of a refresher from the last uh, our presentation last time and uh, hopefully by the end of it things will be uh, crystal clear so without further ado let's get started I'll go briefly over today's topics so we're going to provide a bit of a background for those of you who uh, uh, maybe aren't familiar with the project or uh, haven't been uh, involved in the in in the WSR project for a while go through that then we're going to talk a bit about the overall alter alternatives assessment process so you get an idea of the context within within uh, this sits and then um, we'll talk about alternatives routing and in, in the preferred corridor and then we'll talk about how you can get in contact with with us as well so uh, let's start with the project location um, Webway First Nation sits about 250 kilometers uh, south of Hudson Bay and about about the same distance, maybe a little bit further away uh, than 250 kilometers from James Bay. So that's where that's where it sits in sort of northwestern Ontario, Ontario. And uh, in terms of the purpose of the project, again, this is a uh, the community is what you call the proponent in in. Uh, for this project, so they are they are leading the environmental assessment. This is their they are sponsoring this project. Um, so they have, and then the three main purposes like put, driving um, uh, their desire for this project to go ahead, their desire for this road, is to first of all move material, supplies, and people from the Webequay Airport to the McFalls Lake area. Secondly, to provide employment and economic development opportunities to Webequay, but at the same time preserving their language and culture. And then finally, provide experience and training opportunities for youth to, to help encourage the pursuit of additional skills through, through post-secondary education. In terms of a description of the project itself, um, the road is 107 kilometers uh, from running from Webequay Airport uh, across the island uh, to the mainland and then running southeast uh, and then east uh, to where it ends uh, on the east side of the Mukatai River uh, in the McFalls Lake area. Now, 17 kilometers of the 107 kilometers actually sit on reserve lands as well. So the planning corridor width is two kilometers. So within that two kilometers, we have developed uh, three alternatives, uh, alternative routes within those two that two kilometer corridor. And then the final cleared area would be 35 meters. Um, the corridor width uh, for for a two lane gravel uh, surface road. Uh, in terms of other descriptive parts about the project, um, there's three major water body crossings. One of the uh, Winis of Winisk Lake, which is a, over 200 meters wide, that crossing, and then as the road moves south southeast of Webequay, it crosses the uh, Winiscus Channel, which is about, I think, 50 meters wide. And then at the, so almost at the eastern end of the road, it crosses the Mukatai River, which is about 35 meters wide. So those are the major water body crossings. Um, in terms of uh, 
everything associated with the road, infrastructure associated with the road. Um, it includes te temporary and permanent aggregate uh, pits or, or rock quarry areas with equipment for processing, meaning like crushing the rock. Um, and then th there's access roads associated with each of these areas so that the um, you can set up, uh, you know, these areas for, for use. And uh, we, there would also be during construction, there would be construction camps, which would be temporary. These camps would accommodate construction crews and operations and maintenance offices. That would be a permanent um, piece of infrastructure. And they would include um, support of facilities such as a wastewater treatment plant or potable water storage as well. And then finally, during uh, you know during construction, again temporarily, you would have storage and laydown areas for equipment and materials as well. Let's go into the alternatives assessment process now and, and talk a little bit about that, just to sort of paint the picture for you, so you can see how this all fits into the environmental assessment process. So if we can move to the next slide, there we are. Let's talk about the alternatives assessment process. And so for every undertaking, so in our case, let's call that a project, like the Webaquay Supply Road project, um, a reasonable range of alternatives must be considered during an environmental assessment. That's coming right from MECP. Ministry of the Environment. And alternatives include alternatives to and alternative methods. So what do we mean by alternatives to? Alternatives to the proposed undertaking are what you call functionally different ways of approaching and dealing with a problem or an opportunity. Alternative methods of carrying out the proposed undertaking are different ways of doing the same activity. So it's important to understand the difference between those two. And maybe now let's look at some examples of those. So in terms of alternatives to, again, alternatives to the proposed undertaking are functionally different ways of approaching a problem, approaching and dealing with a problem or opportunity. So in this case, we're looking at an all season community road. You could do nothing. Just leave things the way they are now, like a status quo. You could upgrade, if there were an existing trail between, for example, Webaquay and, and McFalds Lake, you could upgrade that trail to a seasonal winter road as a, as a partial solution. Um, then there's, then there's the, the idea of using alternative modes of transport. So those could be and I'm, you know, these are just possibilities based on what's out there. You could use uh, hovercraft. You could use uh, airships, like cargo airships. Uh, rail is another possibility as well, too. Lots of possibilities in terms of um, alternate modes of transportation. Um, the other thing that you could do is you could manage traffic demand. So by controlling traffic demand, not allowing it to increase too much, you could just allow things to sort of stay the same. Or you could do what is being proposed by Webaquay, which is creating a new all-season road. Now, let's talk about alternative methods through the use of an example. So alternative, me alternative methods of carrying out the proposed undertaking are, again, are different ways of doing the same activity. So in the all case of the all-season road, it would just be different routes. So things alternative, we have three different routes, alternative route one, two, and three. And in this presentation, I'm going to go through how we got to these three routes, the process of getting there. So let's dive into... The, the the core of today's presentation and that's alternative alternatives routing in the preferred corridor an all-season road was identified as the preferred planning solution to fulfill wfn community objectives so of the alternative methods that we just talked about the all-season road 
was the preferred planning solution identified. Now, there has been a lot of study in this area going back as far as 2008, perhaps earlier as well too, but there's been a lot of study looking at different proposed routes for all season roads for different purposes, but still all related and all in the same region. So these studies included the winter road realignment study from 2008, the Cliffs Ferro Alloys Blackthor Mine Integrated Transportation System from 2011, the Norant Resources Eagle's Nest Mine Access Road from 2013, the All Season Community Road Study from 2016, which is a very comprehensive study involving four First Nations, looking at connecting them together and ultimately to the provincial highway system. And then there was sort of a phase two of that involving uh, two communities um, from 2017. So I'll, again, a lot of studies have been done in this area. These were very extensive examinations of alternative road corridors in and around the area, as I mentioned before, and, and alternatives for connecting mine developments to the provincial highway system, as well as communities, bringing communities together, connecting them to each other, and connecting those communities ultimately to the provincial highway system. These were significant efforts and studies to, to examine um, uh, op options for all season roads. And all of these studies provided a foundation for the identification and an initial assessment of alternatives for the proposed uh, Webequay all season road. These, they also provide a bit of a context for the development of the Webequay supply road as well. So as I mentioned, the, I sort of touched on a bit before, these past studies significantly moved the planning process to identifying alternative corridors. When I talk about corridors, these are planning areas. Remember I mentioned earlier that our, our corridor kilometers wide. So within these corridors, within these planning areas, we can identify routes, potential routes. So these studies helped move that process along to identify those alternative corridors and then and then also helped in, in the ultimate sort of future selection of preferred all season road uh, in the in the area or corridors in the area of of, of the mineral resource development that would benefit uh, Webequay First Nation. So as a result of all of this previous work, and, and as I'll get into in a minute, work by the community, um, the identification of the current alternative road core environmental assessment is limited to those between Webequay First Nation and the McFalds Lake area. So that initial identification of Webequay supply road alternative, corridor alternative concepts was based not only on those previous studies that I mentioned before, but years and years of joint sort of community-based uh, land use planning work that was done by Webequay First Nation in concert and in collaboration with the Ministry of Natural Resources and, and Forestry. So this, this was quite an intensive process run essentially by the, the First Nation um, and it involved a lot of community members in, in groups um, incorporating and documenting how they use the land, um, identifying sites of cultural significance and historical and traditional um, and, and areas that are used for historical and traditional practices. And, and the community is almost now at the point of having finalized their community-based land use plan. I believe it's going to be finalized this year. Um, and that plan would sit in the context of the Ontario Far North Act. As part of the vision for the community, Webequay also, I should, I need to mention this, should shows respect for its neighboring communities that they've shared the land with for, for many, many years. And um, therefore that they need to incorporate and they do incorporate these shared interests in the development and impl implementation of the land use plan. Um, 
Webequay truly believes that they are stewards or, or, or caretakers of the land and, 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 and they have the need to live off the land as well as the right to live off the land. The elders and the community as a whole realize the importance of both development and protection and understanding that they need to balance, balance these two. So as I mentioned, as a result of this process, a series of Webequay Supply Road Corridor or alternative concepts were developed. These concepts were screened to identify a corridor upon which to focus investigations during the environmental assessment. So that way we have a limited area within which to conduct those detailed studies that allow us to look at the impact assessment of, of various uh, route alternatives. Screening criteria were, were um, derived from an Indigenous knowledge data uh, that had been collected and prepared by, by Webequay First Nation members. And this was combined with other information that came from from other sources, published sources, uh, from also information collected from field investigations um, com that had been completed. And um, and those help identified, helped identify um, project area sensitivities, areas to be careful, uh, you know, and may, or maybe to avoid in terms of the routing. And we'll get into that in a few minutes. Um, so Webequay, some of Webequay's community-based considerations uh, included caribou, natural or be built features, traditional use areas, fishing, hunting, moose, and source water, which is also was known as spring water or groundwater. And then other considerations were included, such as socioeconomic environment, cultural heritage resources and environments, built environment, natural environment, and technical considerations as well. So from this very detailed screening process, uh, a preliminary preferred corridor was identified. Now, there's a lot of reasons for the rationale and I'll go through them with you right now. Like one of the reasons for that, that preferred corridor is that the route of that corridor is further east and it's away from significant hunting areas, um, i.e. hunting areas for waterfowl, moose, etc., that are used very intensively by community members. It runs east of areas used intensively for traditional activities south of the community as well. It minimizes um, impacts on moose mating areas south of the community and north of the uh, of the proposed east-west section of the uh, corridor. Uh, it minimizes the effects of, of to known built heritage resources or cultural heritage landscapes. You may be asking me what those mean. Well, what those are are things like, are, are, are either, you know, buildings from the past or that are currently used, um, you know, in traditional activities such as cabins or hunting blinds or sacred sites as well. Um, other rationale used was to minimize the uh, impacts to First Nation reserve lands, to minimize the number of water body crossings required because of impacts on, on fish and fish habitat, however temporary, um, min minimizes the potential effects to fish and fish habitat. Uh, I just mentioned this about fewer water body crossings and um, and then, you know, minimizing the uh, the crossing, uh, the width of the crossings as well, too. So positioning the road so that it crosses at narrower points across major water courses. And again, you know, cost as well as part of it, too. Lowest estimated co capital cost for construction. So next, routes had to be identified within the preferred corridor. And some of the routing criteria include included root length, surficial material, meaning, um, so for example, mineral versus organic soils. Mineral soils are more able to be consolidated or compacted 
and can form like sort of a, a more solid base. Organic soils are, for example, like very silt, a uh, fine particle uh, soils that um, like uh, uh, silt, for example, that are very mushy and uh, very muddy and, and uh, very difficult to compact. Um, bogs and fens are criteria, root, definite rooting criteria as well too, trying to avoid them or minimize the, the, uh, the, um, the length of the road that traverses through bogs and fens, wetland areas. Topographic relief and slopes, well, topographic relief refers to the height of the land, so the changes in the shape or, or height of the land. Um, availability of bedrock borrow, so availability of, of both bedrock and aggregate, so aggregate smaller uh, material, naturally occurring smaller material like gravel, and then uh, bedrock would be larger rock sources that could be used to create smaller material by, uh, by processing, like crushing. Um, and then avoiding extensive wetland and what you call thermokarst. If you've ever flown over the area, you see these sort of round-like pits filled with water. Um, that's what you would call thermokarst uh, affected terrain. Um, obviously, width of river crossings, as mentioned before, and as mentioned before, proximity to potential aggregate sources as well. So, so these root alternatives were identified with a view to minimize the total root length, to follow routes that maximize terrain units of what you call favorable constructability. So where it's easier to build so where you have better soils for example like glacial tills which are a little bit more compactable can form a better base for the road minimizing crossing uh, terrain units of poor constructability such as fens or bogs or areas where um, you have organic soils as well and then um, again wild wide river crossings avoiding those and then identifying um, and then having the road, trying to make sure the road stays close close to where the aggregate and rock sources are to limit haul distances for, for trucks um, for construction of the road. It keeps the cost down and it allows the road to be built faster as well too. So lots of uh, factors were considered in routing within the preferred corridor. And uh, if we can put up the final slide, all of this hard work resulting in three alternatives the three that i mentioned to you before so what i've tried to do for you today is just sort of paint that picture and and tell you the story of how we got to where we are and the thinking that's behind it because there it's happened over a long period of time there's been a lot of work involved by different groups and all that information has come together and the community has worked very hard and met over long periods of time to inventory um you know their community of all the important places that they don't want disturbed and all that information was put together and then the community themselves was able to identify a community a community preferred route and so now we have three alternatives within that preferred corridor so that's where we have ended up now and uh, if we can move to the next slide i just want to um, encourage everyone to participate in these in these uh, uh, sessions, these live stream sessions. Um, contact information is on the screen for you now. You can also visit our website, supplyroad.ca, where there's tons of information and lots of information on how you can contact us with your comments or questions about the project as well, too. You can fill out a feedback form. There's lots of different ways to get in contact with us, and we welcome, we welcome your input. So, um that finishes everything up for today and um we hope it was helpful we hope you have a pretty good understanding now of how those rude alternatives were identified um, we're going to get into more detail again as part of this series of of uh, live streams and radio shows as well don't forget to keep in touch with our project team members via as i mentioned the um, supplyroad.ca website Miigwech, and we will talk to you again in two weeks when we talk about the evaluation of alternative road corridors. Miigwech, see you again soon.